It's time for Heroclix History. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another Heroclix video. I wanted to do something a little bit different, uh, maybe a series we can start doing going forward. But uh, I've noticed there hasn't been really anything out there about the history of Heroclix, uh, whether it's the product itself or the competitive, you know, metagame, competitive gaming, like worlds or nationals or anything like that. So, you know, I wanted to talk about uh, the, his the history of Heroclix, at least uh, the competitive part of it. Uh, because I know it is part of the uh, history of Heroclix, right? Because aside from collecting it, it is a game. So, uh, and a lot of people like to enjoy it that way. So, let's start with the 2010 World Championship. Uh, the reason why I picked that first is because that's the first official Worlds event where it was uh, when NECA took over. So, it was WizKids before, and then... Tops took over and then NECA took over. Uh, they still retained the Whiskey's name, but you know, the parent company's NECA. And this is also when they actually kind of streamlined the format, whereas before they used to have uh, Wizard World events or regionals, and then they used to kind of have like floor events where 50% of the the set the fifty percent of the team has to be from one set. Now this is just kind of like the modern, because that kind of had uh, all the figures in the legal sets were carded at this point because before that there were some carded some not so this was kind of like the real uh, first real event that had carded figures the entire format uh, and it, it was in 2010 because in 2009 there was no there were no worlds it was 2008 so 2009 it was a, a hiatus and then 2010 when it came back better than ever and it's kind of like how we see how world is today so going back to that era uh during that time there are no real qualifying uh events that led up to worlds kind of like not how we have it now where people have to win whiskeds opens and national stuff like that to get their seats at worlds all of this was qualifying through the various days and events of uh the actual uh, origins because this event was held at the origins convention in Indianapolis, I'm sorry, Columbus. And you had to go through like two or three days of qualifying with the various formats, sealed, floor, whatever. And then you got to the finals, uh, which was modern, right? Modern as we know now. And back then it was the sets that were legal were Justice League, I'm sorry, Avengers, which was in 2007. That was the first major set that had cards. And then the latest set was Brave and the Bold. Uh, Brave and the Bold had just been released, so it was brand new, so a lot of people were trying out a lot of new stuff there. Uh, the metagame for that period was <laughs> is very interesting because there are a lot of uh, figures that have kind of weird point values, number one, but also because of the higher point values that they were back then, you know, we're not used to that now because everything is so low and efficient and cheap that uh, you can fit a whole bunch of figures back then. You know, four or five figures was considered a lot. Um, six would have been a gigantic swarm team back then. Whereas now, six is almost like the average. You know, um, some a lot of teams go to like eight, nine pieces. But uh, the format, uh, I'm sorry, the metagame was dominated by the Black Adam Shazam figure. You could see from Brave and the Bold. Uh, most people played it on the Shazam dial because it has hypersonic with uh, five damage and prob and then it also has super strength so you can you know back then you could combine it together and then the other top attackers during that time were the smoky feet cap from hammer of thor uh, ignores you know elevated uh, outdoor blocking and uh, characters and hindering so that was really good. And then the Spider-Man from Secret Invasion, the one that had, uh, it's only 50 points, very efficient, I think six clicks, and it has flurry as well. But it didn't have really move and attack, but you kind of had to TK it. But he was a solid uh, attacker at 50 points. And then uh, more, of, and then the support pieces that people were playing were like Scarlet Witch, Jason Blood, the prob pieces, uh, Light Speed was the, a good taxi, moved far, cheap, uh, and then, you know, they had like some kind of offbeat 
type of pieces like Metron was like the tent pole. Um, back then, the tent pole is a little bit different. More the tent pole is more like you know close to 200 points or more. Whereas now the tent poles could be less. It could be like 150, 140, 160 around there. But back then, Metron at 195 was like the tent pole, and uh, you know they uh, one of the top teams, which kind of dominated the metagame for for like a year or so was with uh metron thing and then later on became metron nightcrawler but we'll get into that when i get to it but um i wanted to talk about some of the players that were there uh, i have it was kind of hard to try to find out what what people were playing who was playing and things like that because back you know there's no coverage it was all on hc realms uh, just people posting about their experiences and what's happening kind of like reporting on the scene so i have the top eight teams from that era or from the worlds uh there was an avengers team there's no particular order there's avengers team theme team oh one more thing theme teams were kind of a new concept because they didn't have keywords pre-carded and then they added keywords when they had the cards and then whiskers really wanted to push Theme team, so that's how they they came up with uh, theme team probs and getting your map roll bonus by being a theme team. So, uh, interesting note there. They gave out uh, LEs to everyone in the finals in the finals day who were pl who was playing a theme team. So the, what they would do is say, um, "Who here? Raise your hand if you're playing a theme team," and they'd go around and give like an LE, right, a Connolly because they really wanted to push theme teams and you know they were kind of using that event to see if theme teams were actually worth playing and we'll take a look at the top eight right here so the first one is an avengers team which had a spider woman spider-man cap like i said hawkeye uh, and the thunderbolts ata and back then they had atas for those who don't know their additional team abilities and you could just play one but you could just put it on anybody as long as it was only one and you apply it to every person that had it uh, the keyword now you have to do it with theme teams, but back then you could just put on, you could slap it on anybody. But uh, the team was an Avengers theme team, and you know, obviously we're looking at the Hawkeye from the actually Avengers set, which has a legacy card now. So you could take a look at that, and you know that was like one of the better attackers back then. Uh, and then there was a Black Adam Shazam team. Uh, there was what three of them here. Three Black Adam Shazam teams, whether it had like Edward Nigma, uh, Cap, or you know Scarlet Witches and Jason Bloods. Uh, then there was a Metron and Thing team, which was the the only real tent pole there. And then there was a Spider Man, Cap, Jason Blood, Cave Carson, uh, out of the shadows, Batman, Scarlet Witch. So just a you know concoction of good pieces. Um, and then there was a team of two Spider Man, two Caps. And Scarlet Witch, so it's another Avengers theme. And then there was uh, Dawnstar, Nico Minoru, Three Kid Flashes. And uh, it was a teen theme team, which they have since retired that keyword, teen. So there's no more teens. Um, and then the last one was the Shazam Black Adam, two Scarlet Witches, two Jason Bloods. So there are one, two, three, uh, four, five out of the eight teams, I think, are theme teams. So people were actually trying to play them. But uh, in the top four, we had, uh, oh, and also the players that were there, the, the comp I think they were saying at the time, this was the best uh, competition that they've had at the, at the high, high level because uh, they had players like George Masu, the eventual champion and future Hall of Famer, uh, Scott Crampton, future Hall of Famer, Ed Arnold Berkowitz, future Hall of Famer, Matt Esbrook. Future Hall of Famer. And then the defending champion from 2008, Ben Chung, the guy who did, uh, designed Nightcrawler. So five out of the eight players are, you know, four of them still play today and still one of the best, uh, some of the best players now. And one of them went on to become, uh, you know, a designer for WizKids and you know, designer for their, uh, not just for Heroclix, but other games within WizKids. So uh, at least five really top-notch best of the best players that were there and then in the top four there were three all three of the black adam shazam teams made it and then the lone outsider was the metron thing team which oh i'm sorry also alan mason was there 
Oh, I apologize, Alan. I know you watch your video sometimes. But Alan Mason, uh, surefire future Hall of Famer for sure. Uh, anybody who knows Alan Mason back in the day used to be the boogeyman in all of California, especially up in the Bay Area, but all up and down California and West Coast. Alan Mason was the man. Um, so six out of eight players there, top. So um, I even missed another one. Rob Barazel was on there too. So he's also a Hall of Famer. So seven out of the eight players uh, were top, top notch. And what is that? Five of them are Hall of Famers? Five Hall of Famers, future one. And then the other one is a defending champ. And in the top four, Rob Barzell with a Black Adam Shazam, George Massey with Black Adam Shazam, Ben Chung with Black Adam Shazam, and Alan Mason with the Thing Metron. And then in the finals, it was Alan Mason against George Masu, Thing Metron versus Mystical Theme Team. And you can, I'll link the video, but there is a very grainy old school footage from a camcorder, I believe, or it might even been a uh, old cell phone footage, but uh, you, you'll be able to see it uh, in the link. There's a little screenshot of it right here. Sorry, here. But um, in the finals, the team that George played with his infinite <laughs> prob team, because all five of his pieces have prob, um, just outlasted the thing Metron. And you know, it's anybody knows the the uh, history of or, or, or you know what happened in the game. Alan forgot about first round immunity, went all the way up, tried to outwit the hypersonic on Shazam. Uh, didn't you know? Forgot that George just passed his first turn with Shazam. He just uh, he was the only one that kind of stayed in the starting area, and then he couldn't outwit him. And then Shazam just hypered and clocked him, and took out Metron real quick. So um, the. The team that he played, the mystical theme team, was, you know, aside from the theme team probs that he has, he just has two additional, per he has two perplexes when he turns into Etrigan, and then he uh, has five regular probs on his team. So it became really hard for you to hit him, and it became much easier for him to hit you because all of his uh, probs, right? So at this point, it's just a statistics formula, right? You're just, whereas Alan's attacking him, he has to hit one time in like, or he has to hit like five or six times in a row to hit it stick, whereas George needs to just hit one time in five or six rolls. But anyway, uh, George ended up winning. Um, he designed Black Adam in the Superman set, which is super rare, great sculpt, nice figure for the time. And... Uh, the um, kind of like the fallout of that was they kind of changed or fallout of the event. They kind of changed a lot of the the rules about how the high level events run because back then, if you if you were late or you were not late, I'm sorry, um, if you misregistered a team, you were disqualified. Not even a game loss. You're just completely disqualified. Anything go anything that was any infraction was an automatic DQ, no kind of warning, whatever. Um, if you started on the wrong click, that's where you're at. Um, back then there were no click numbers, so short clicking was a common thing that you can see that happen. And because of that, they started coming out with uh, click numbers. And um, I'm not sure what set they came out with that, but it might've been Web of Spider-Man. But uh, that's why you see the click numbers now that we all know and, you know, expect to see in these dials so that everyone can keep track what click you're on. But back then, there were no click numbers. So you cut and there was no dials on the back either. So you kind of, you know, I, I hit you for four, right? Yeah, this is this is click four. And, and back then, you couldn't click through the dial because it's supposed to be um, no, uh, the dials were not public information. So if you clicked it, that was it. And you can't click back and forth. Uh, unless it's healing or damaging and then uh the f i believe that they yeah well shortly after i mean i guess you know a couple years after a few years after they started doing whisk kids opens and then they started qualifying through nationals to get to worlds and so that you can get your seats instead of just doing it at worlds that was still an option but you can get there in other ways so they use that for uh 
they use the data that they got from 2010 worlds to you know make what what you see worlds is now so um yep that was it uh you know i'll put up all the uh, relevant links for if you want to find out more about the the event but uh just a, a sample of the prize in george Gotti. i think he got a manhattan convention exclusive he got a factory set of brave and the bold and i think he got a case of web of spider-man on top of like whatever the connelly's that they had at the time but um yeah that was it and you know george his legend kind of grew even more and became what it is today. So hope you got. Hopefully you guys enjoyed uh, that trip back to Memory Lane history. For those of you who just started later in the game's uh, lifetime, but uh, you know if you're interested in playing high level clicks, you know when live in play, live in person events come back, you know be sure to hit up your WizKids Opens or, or Nationals Rock events or Worlds even. So. All right, that's it for this one. First episode, let me know what you think. Uh, I know I kind of jumped around a little bit because, you know, just the first time doing it, I'm trying to uh, still kind of get my footing on this. But um, hopefully that was educational, I guess. And, you know, a little bit of tidbits you know about the past. Uh, Heroclix events. So until next time, guys, only bad players bring the dice. See ya.